Hey listeners, Lainey here. The True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival is happening yet again July 12th through the 14th, 2024 in beautiful Denver, Colorado. Use code Lainey at checkout for 15% off your ticket. I hope to see you there. I'm the co-founder of it. It's a weekend full of ethics, advocacy, and really getting to hang out one-on-one with your favorite podcasters. It is not an overpriced event where you get a glimpse at somebody. You get genuine one-on-one time. And what I will say is if you are a VIP level ticket holder, then you get to invite your favorite creator to a VIP mixer and have even more one-on-one time for a special little cocktail hour. Anyways, I hope to see you there. It would mean so much to me if you use my code Lainey for 15% off. Go to truecrimepodcastfestival.com to see all of the other amazing creators that are coming, like John Lorden, Derek Lebasser, Stephanie Harlow, Josh from True Crime BS, Charlie from Crime Lines, Eric from True Consequences, and many, many more talented creators. I can't wait to see you there. Hey friends, Lainey here again, and this time I need to give a special thank you and shout out to Asheville River Cabins for hosting me and a bunch of my friends, Charlie from Crime Lines, Robin from The Trail Went Cold, Justin from Gen Y, and Josh from True Crime BS uh, in mid-April to celebrate Charlie's birthday and to also host a podcaster's retreat where we talked business, talked shop. It was just so much fun and so relaxing. It's right on the French Broad River in Asheville, and it was beautiful. I stayed in the Looking Glass Cabin, and when I tell you, you need to book there when you go next time. I just, I love them so much. I was so thankful for them, and if you're in the area or planning to go to Asheville soon, please consider visiting them. I'm going to link them in the show notes so you can check them out, but they are incredible. And I'm going to post some videos and pictures to social media so you can check them out for yourself. Explicit content is found in this episode. So listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to True Crime Cases. I'm your host, Lainey. In 2020, the FBI had a shocking admission to make regarding the homicide clearance rates of police investigations across America. Homicide clearance rates are a way of tracking how many murder cases are considered solved, usually where at least one suspect is arrested and charged with the homicide. The FBI calculates the clearance rate by dividing the total number of cleared crimes by the number of new offenses reported in a given year. For example, if 100 crimes, old or new, were solved in 2020, but 150 new crimes occurred during the same period, the clearance rate would be approximately 67%. While not an exact science, this doesn't seem too unfavorable. After all, in the 1980s, the homicide clearance rate across the U.S. was around 70%, which was considered quite respectable. However, we're not living in the 1980s anymore. According to FBI data, the homicide clearance rate in the U.S. hit a record low in 2020, plummeting to under 50%, and it hasn't bounced back since. This means that roughly half of all murders remain unsolved, an unsettling statistic, especially given the current surge in murders and violent crimes. You might assume that the exponential increase in such crimes is causing investigators to fall behind, but that assumption would be incorrect. Despite our declining rates, Germany has managed to maintain a homicide clearance rate of over 90%. Both of today's cases occurred in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2012 and remain unsolved to this day. One involves an unsolved murder, while the other is a case of a missing person whose fate turned into murder, both victims being black women from vastly different backgrounds. Okay, on to the show. Furbia Tinsley, who went by Faye to all who knew her, was born in 1961 to parents Cornelius Tinsley and Barbara Smith Page. She was born and raised in Charlottesville, Virginia, and was the only girl out of five siblings. Her brothers were Jeffrey, Corey, Benjamin, and Cornelius. According to one of Faye's neighbors, she was a good, quiet, and private person, and this is reflected in the lack of information available about her life. Her mother Barbara called Faye beautiful in every way, saying, not only talking about looks, but she was just good to everybody. That seems to be the consensus about Faye, that she was a gentle, loving, and generous woman who would do anything to help anyone, even if they were a complete stranger. 
It's pretty fitting to find out that the kind and lovely Fay had once been a pageant contender, as reported by Small Town Big Crime. We also know that Fay worked in the U.S. military for a while in the 1980s, but her service was cut short when a vehicle accident left her with a traumatic head injury. Though initially her prognosis wasn't clear, Fay went on to make a decent enough recovery that she could largely look after herself and live an independent and successful life. At some point, Fay was also diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but this was easily managed with medication that Fay was diligent about taking. Fay received disability benefits from the military due to the nature of her injury, and for the most part, that made up her primary form of income. She went on to have two children, a daughter, Talambria Tinsley, fondly known as Tootie, and then a son, Tony Chavez. When Tootie was still very young, Fay met Tony's father, Sebastian Chavez, in the early 1990s, working at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Salem, Virginia, where one or both of them worked at the time. Sebastian, as you might have guessed from where they met, was also a veteran and would go on to collect military benefits and wages himself. Faye and Sebastian's son Tony was born around 1993, making him three years younger than Tootie. Although they never married, Faye and Sebastian were reportedly engaged for years. But marriage wasn't a priority for either of them. They were content in their status as life partners. Faye faced several health issues throughout her life, some likely stemming from the brain injury and bipolar disorder. Sebastian took on a caregiving role for her, happy to care for the woman that he loved. By 2012, Faye had become a grandmother, and Tootie's daughter, Manaya adored her grandma, Faye. Faye cherished spending time with her girls. In June 2012, Faye, her mother, Barbara, her daughter, Tootie, and little Manaya went on vacation to Virginia Beach. Faye also enjoyed baking with Manaya, which they planned to do together during the second weekend of July 2012. Tragically, fate had other plans for Faye. On the night of July 13th, Faye visited Tootie before heading to play bingo at the VFW Lodge in Charlottesville. Tootie gave her $40 for the evening, expecting to see her again the next morning as they had plans for her to babysit Manaya. Later, after bingo ended between 10 and 11 p.m., Tootie received a joyful call from Faye, who had turned that $40 into $600 in winnings. Faye intended to deposit at least some of that money into the bank on her way home for safekeeping, although it's unclear from reports whether this deposit was confirmed by bank records. Upon returning home, Faye found Sebastian watching TV. They spent some time together before Faye went to bed around 1.30 a.m., while Sebastian fell asleep on the couch. Faye called her daughter early on July 14th, but Tootie missed the call, assuming her mom was canceling plans to babysit. Another call was made around the same time, but the recipient's identity was unknown until later. Now, most of the details from this point come from an investigation by the Crime Junkie podcast. And so we want to thank our listener, Leah, who recommended the show and also the topic for this episode. So thank you again to Leah. At around 5 a.m., a woman who lived on Prospect Avenue, about 15 minutes from Faye's home, was sitting and smoking on her porch when she heard two gunshots. Now, this wasn't an unusual occurrence for the area. And since nobody shouted for help or screamed following the shots, the woman didn't react. She finished smoking and went inside, leaving the house again around 7 a.m. to go to work, only to find an unfamiliar car in front of her home. It was idling with its headlights on, and she was alarmed enough that she went back inside and asked her husband to come to check out the vehicle. Her husband approached the car, only to recoil immediately and though he tried to stop his wife from seeing what was inside, it was already too late. She had seen the awful state of the person inside the car. The woman was black, middle-aged, still wearing her seatbelt, but not alive. She was tilting to one side, slumped over the steering wheel and surrounded by blood. Police were called, and when they arrived, they pronounced the woman dead at the scene. It was, of course, 51-year-old Faye Tinsley, she had been shot twice, once in the head and once in the neck. And to this day, medical examiners are unsure about the exact trajectory of the bullets. 
Where was the shooter when they attacked her? It wasn't clear, and that wasn't all that was baffling. When she was found, Faye's car had its doors locked, its windows were rolled up. There was no sign of her purse, her wallet, or the murder weapon. And there wasn't any sign of a struggle having taken place. That final point seems to be contested in some early reporting, where claims were made that Faye's car had been ransacked, but that appears to be a miscommunication between the police and the public. Unfortunately, the rumors of something going down on Prospect Avenue reached Faye's family before the police did. Photos of the scene, although not graphic, were sent to Tootie, and when she recognized her mom's car, she raced to the scene. Sebastian was woken up by his phone blowing up with texts and calls, telling him that his truck was involved in a crime scene and he needed to get to Prospect Avenue. Because of this, by the time the investigators wanted to get in touch with the family, they were able to find them in the crowd that had grown around the closed-off scene. Both Tootie and Sebastian were distraught, Tootie in particular, needing to be held up by friends in the crowd. Although they soon became convinced of his innocence, investigators' first port of call was to interview Sebastian about his fiancée's comings and goings, especially over the last 24 hours. His version of events was corroborated by Tootie's own account, and he claimed he had still been asleep when Faye left that morning. He didn't know why she left, when she left, or what she was doing in that area of Prospect Avenue. But he did have a bombshell to drop on the investigation. Sebastian was very open during this interview and willingly admitted to having an affair with a woman who lived nearby, sometimes paying her for sex. He claimed that there was nothing romantic or particularly intimate about the relationship and that he didn't think Faye knew about it. This woman was referred to by the pseudonym Amy by reporters and lived close by to the location where Faye's body had been found. Not only that, but police soon realized that Tootie lived only a few doors down from this Amy woman, and because of that, Tootie had discovered Sebastian was cheating on her mom from gossip among other neighbors. Tootie was torn. She didn't want to ruin the life Faye had been living with her partner of almost two decades by shattering the illusion of fidelity. Still, eventually, she couldn't continue lying by omission. Only a few weeks before Faye was found murdered, Tootie told her mom what Sebastian had been hiding from her, and somehow, Faye got in touch with Amy's partner, referred to as Roy. In fact, that other mystery phone call Faye had made on the morning of July 14th, it was to Roy, and the police had their next interviewee to look up. It didn't take long for them to find him, living with his mother in the same neighborhood as Amy's home. At least, that's where he should have been. However, not long after Faye's body was discovered, Roy and his mother went to stay with the family in a nearby county for a while, and no reason was given for this. What Roy told them from there is the only account we have of the hours between Sebastian last seeing Faye and her body being discovered on Prospect Avenue. I'll let you decide for yourselves whether you believe it or not. According to Roy, Faye had met him at his mother's house early that morning to discuss their partner's affairs and what they should do moving forward. He told police that both of them were unhappy with the knowledge of the affair, but it is not clear whether he gave any further details, how long they spoke, or where they had this discussion. Roy's following statement was that, as Faye began to leave, a man he vaguely recognized from the local area approached them asking if he could get a ride to Prospect Avenue. For some reason, Roy joined Faye in her car when she offered to take this stranger where he needed to go. It isn't clear where either of the men sat in the vehicle. I'm not sure whether Roy was vague on those details or if the police have not specified them due to their ongoing investigation. Regardless, when they arrived at Prospect Avenue, Roy said that the stranger refused to leave the car. He made no attempt to threaten or bargain with Faye or Roy, instead pulling out a gun and promptly shooting Faye in the head and neck. Roy reported that he was terrified and simply fled the scene at that point, not knowing where the man went following the murder. Despite apparently being shaky on a lot of the other details about the events of that morning, Roy was able to provide police with an oddly thorough description of the suspect. 
He said that the man was black, light-skinned between 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 11 in height, and muscular. Roy was also able to describe a number of cursive tattoos on the man that he had across his arms, possibly including an M on one hand and a C on the other. One final detail absent from some records is that the man had a thin beard with a patch of thicker hair on the chin. One element of this had proof to back it up. Roy stopped in at a convenience store between the street where he had abandoned Faye and his mother's home. A clerk at the store told police that a visibly shaken and disheveled man walked in barefoot at about 5.30 a.m. that morning. Surveillance footage confirmed this man's identity as Roy, but no further details about this interaction have been disclosed to the public. And that is pretty much all we know or think we know. No single tip about someone fitting Roy's description of the suspect has ever been reported. Faye's purse and wallet, missing from the scene of the crime, have never been found. The murder weapon has not been found either, although police believe that it has changed hands since Faye's murder, as ballistics have since tied the weapon to other unrelated crimes. Roy and Amy, who both have criminal records before and after the time of Faye's murder, remain persons of interest in this case. Roy, in particular, had been charged with domestic violence against Amy. Although they have been interviewed about the events surrounding Faye's death multiple times, following arrests in conjunction with unrelated crimes, they remain firm on their stories. Both are believed to still be in Virginia, though they are no longer together. One perplexing aspect that puzzles everyone is why anyone would want to harm Faye. An early theory suggested that someone may have been aware of her bingo winnings and attempted to steal her earnings. However, Faye had already deposited the money in the bank and her car was not searched for additional cash. Moreover, as Sebastian told reporters, Faye was known to assist anyone in need, so she likely wouldn't have resisted a robbery. It's unclear why someone would choose to murder her instead of taking the money and just leaving. Additionally, how would they have known where Faye would be that morning, when even her daughter and fiancé were unaware of her whereabouts? Sebastian Chavez left the state following Faye's death, but continues to check in with the police in case any progress has been made. Faye's mother, Barbara, simply wants to speak to her killer, to ask, Why did you have to shoot her? Barbara finds her solace and her faith in God, believing that Faye is now with him, safe and happy. Faye's daughter, Talambria Tootie Tinsley, lives in fear for the safety of the rest of her family. Her mother's killer remains at large, and Tootie and her children still reside in the area. Tootie struggles daily without her mother, who was her go-to person for everything. She runs a Facebook page called Justice for Furbia Faye Tinsley, hoping someone will come forward to help solve her mother's case. In the days following Faye's death, her friends and family held a vigil in her memory releasing blue balloons into the air, as blue was her favorite color. Her funeral service was held a week after her murder, on July 21, 2012, at First Baptist Church on Main Street. As recently as 2020, Charlottesville police have been urging the community to provide any tips they may have about Faye Tinsley's murder. She was driving her green Honda SUV in the area of the 800 block of Prospect Avenue, before 7 a.m. on the morning of July 14, 2012. There is a $2,500 reward for any information leading to the arrest of Faye's murderer. Anyone with information is asked to call the police department at 434-970-3280 or Crime Stoppers at 434-977-4000. This episode of True Crime Cases with Lainey is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey there, fellow true crime listeners. As we gear up for another exciting year of the True Crime Podcast Festival, I can't help but feel the weight of the planning process. Making sure everything runs smoothly and that our attendees leave happy, it's a big responsibility. But you know what? I found a way to manage the stress and anxiety that comes with it. Thanks to BetterHelp. I've got a licensed therapist right at my fingertips now. Whether it's navigating event logistics or dealing with the pressure to ensure everyone has a fantastic time, my therapist helps me work through it all. 
And listen, therapy isn't just for dark moments. It's for those everyday stressors as well. It's about finding balance and peace of mind, especially when life gets busy. And the best part? BetterHelp makes it easy. With their online platform, I can connect with my therapist from anywhere, anytime. And it's perfect for a busy event planner like me, podcaster, voice actor, mom, etc. You know, it's super accessible. So if you're feeling the pressure like I am or just need someone to talk to, why not give BetterHelp a try? That's betterhelp.com slash tccases today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash tccases. As we transition from Faye Tinsley's case to Sage Smith's case, we shift our focus to another haunting mystery that unfolded in Charlottesville. While Faye's case gripped the community with its unsolved questions, Sage's disappearance added another layer of tragedy and uncertainty. Now, let's delve into the perplexing case of Sage Smith, a young woman whose vanishing act left her family and investigators searching for answers in the same city streets that bore witness to Faye's unsolved murder. Sage Smith was born in Charlottesville in 1993, into a childhood of poverty and being shuttled from foster home to foster home. By the time she was three years old, her mother had been deemed unfit to care for her, and she was being raised by her grandmother in a neighborhood that grew to feel like a prison to the family over time. We know that her father, Dean, also spent time in prison, but it is unclear what he was doing time for or how many times he was sentenced. Her grandmother, Lolita Smith, fondly referred to as Miss Cookie, said that Sage was the type of person everyone was friends with, and her smile would light up a room. Yet Sage was bullied by other children for the way she presented herself and acted. And still, despite these conditions, Sage managed to thrive where others didn't. She met a girl called Shakira Washington when they were both very young, and they became such good friends that later in life they moved in together. Sage was the first person in her family to graduate from high school, which was a huge, difficult achievement for her, and she decided to pursue a career in cosmetology. Her mother was once again deemed unfit to care for her in the fall of 2012, But by then, Sage was old enough that the foster care department decided to pay for her to move into her own apartment. That was a fantastic first step into freedom for Sage, who invited her childhood friend Shakira and another friend named Aubrey Carson to move in with her. It also meant she could begin bringing friends over to practice her hair braiding. All the while, she got a job at the bottom rung of a local hair salon, sleeping hair. She was an incredibly brave young person who grew into an even braver young woman. Sage came to her grandmother Lolita when she was only a teenager, asking her grandmother not to be upset with what she was going to tell her. Sage then told her grandmother that she was gay, and Lolita said with kind and gentle amusement, You aren't telling me anything that I don't already know. Sage began to realize she was a woman as she came to terms with her identity. It was when she told those closest to her that she was transgender that she began using the name Sage. As a note, many articles and reports on this case, including statements from Sage's family, still use her birth name and pronouns. Out of respect for Sage, we'll be referring to her solely by the name and pronouns that she used for herself at the time of her last known sighting. According to one particular source, the three friends, Sage, Shakira, and Aubrey, were partiers and would allegedly sometimes engage in sex work. Whatever the reason, they were meeting up with men. However, they always did their best to ensure their friends were safe when they went out. They would text each other updates to ensure that everything was going okay. Apparently, this was a necessary safety measure. While looking into Sage's social media, a journalist named Emma Eisenberg discovered Facebook messages warning Sage to, quote, watch her back for people who had unfinished business with her. Sage possibly triggered these messages by telling someone's wife that he had been unfaithful. It looks like Sage may have been the more reckless of the three roommates, too, as she put out casual encounter ads on Craigslist against the advice of Shakira and Aubrey. 
The ads, to an extent, made sense, as they were one way for Sage to seek relationships with men who already knew she was trans before they met up. Even then, though, it was still risky, and it may have been what eventually stole Sage's life from her. On November 9, 2012, 19-year-old Sage Smith changed her Facebook profile to display her gender as female, and she came out publicly to everyone on her friends list as she did. Sage also proudly posted a message saying, I am a girl now, hashtag respect it. She was fully ready to embrace her true identity and had her whole life ahead of her to revel in it. Since Thanksgiving was just around the corner, Sage already had much to look forward to. She was going to pay a surprise visit to her stepsisters for the holiday and was excited to see them. She hoped to see her mom's new home while she was there. On the morning of November 20th, the day before Thanksgiving, she called her father, Dean. He recalled her being in a great mood, congratulating him on having been out of prison for a year. She also may have asked him for money to get her hair braided or buy something for her apartment, like a TV, which was nothing out of the ordinary. And that night, 19-year-old Sage had a date with 21-year-old Eric McFadden. The two had met online, possibly through one of Sage's Craigslist ads. And whatever relationship they had was, by all accounts, complicated. They had been seeing each other for a while, but it wasn't something Eric wanted people to know about, because he was attracted to Sage. She was transgender, and Eric seemed to be having conflicting feelings about his sexuality. From what I can tell, it does not appear that even Aubrey or Shakira, Sage's closest friends, knew about Eric. Eric was already in a relationship with Esther Evini when he started dating Sage. Speculation arose that Esther may have given Sage money to keep quiet about being with Eric. Some suggest this payment may have been hush money or payment for supplying sex work to Eric, but there's no concrete evidence of this transaction. Regardless of the true nature of their relationship, Sage spent hours that afternoon getting ready to see Eric. By 5.40 p.m., she was ready to leave and woke up her roommate Aubrey to let her know that she was going out, but would be back later that evening. Sage left the apartment, and Aubrey went back to sleep. Twenty minutes later, Eric started to text her, asking if she was standing him up. It isn't clear whether she responded to these text messages, but we do know that she was on the phone with someone from North VA at approximately 6.18 p.m., this comes from both Sage's phone records and Sage's own stepsister, Kiara Morgan, who witnessed Sage while she was headed to a bus stop. Kiara heard Sage tell whoever was on the phone that she would be there in five minutes, but had no way of knowing who she was speaking to. Was this caller Eric? It isn't clear from the available information, but he was still texting her at 627 to ask where she was. The next account of Sage's whereabouts came from a witness on West Main Street in Charlottesville, who said that Sage told them she was meeting someone at the Amtrak station around 6.30 p.m. According to this unnamed witness, Sage then proceeded to walk toward the station. By 7 p.m., she was either at the Amtrak station or the Wild Wing Cafe next to it. And that was, to this day, the last known sighting of Sage Smith. Sources vary substantially about the following timings. Back at their apartment, Aubrey either woke up from her nap at 8 p.m. that same night or woke up the next morning. Surprised that Sage wasn't home, she checked in on her as the three roommates often did when one of their numbers was out on a date. But when she phoned Sage, the call went straight to voicemail. She tried again with the same results. This immediately raised red flags for Aubrey, because Sage always answered her phone. So Aubrey reached out to some of their mutual friends, and when none of them heard from Sage, Aubrey quickly grew fearful for her friend. Aubrey then did the only thing she could think of and called Sage's grandmother Lolita. Trying to remain calm, Lolita told Aubrey to report Sage to the police as missing if she still wasn't home by a certain time, 10 p.m. according to one account. The hour came and went, and Aubrey called the police either that night or around noon the next day, which was November 21st, 2012. She said the officer she spoke to was calm and didn't take many details. Charlottesville police didn't wait long to begin searching for the missing teenager. 
By November 24, they were conducting grid searches of the areas Sage had last been seen, including places where an injured person or body may have been concealed, like parking lots, fields, landfills, and the University of Virginia campus. Unfortunately, they continuously came up empty-handed, and there was no sign of Sage and no security cameras in the area that may have caught her final movements. While police began their investigation, Sage's family leaped into action, not wanting to waste a second while Sage was missing. They knew it was completely uncharacteristic for friends and family not to hear from Sage for so long, so they logged into her cell phone account to see who, if anyone, she had been talking to. They discovered a number that was not recognized, so Sage's father, Dean, posted it on Facebook to see if anyone familiar with the family knew who it belonged to. A friend of Sage's was able to provide some answers. Yanni Ortiz knew both Sage and Eric and was able to provide the family and police with his name. Other friends of Eric's confirmed that Eric had been planning to meet someone on West Main Street that night. And that wasn't all. Yanni told them that Eric had reached out to her on the night of November 20th, telling her to delete his contact information from her phone. Thankfully, she didn't. Dean was able to use this information to track down where Eric worked, a Sherwin-Williams paint store, and when police contacted the store, they discovered Eric had not shown up for work in three days. They didn't know then that he was never coming back. On November 25th, Eric called his girlfriend Esther Eveni, asking for money. He told her he was in Washington, D.C., and she told him that the police were looking for him. Eric did his best to convince Esther that he didn't leave Charlottesville because of Sage or anything to do with her, though he did allege that Sage was blackmailing him about their relationship. Esther tried to get him to come home or at least contact the lead investigator, but he didn't take her advice. The next time they spoke, he was in New York City. The next, he emailed Esther claiming he was going to catch a bus back to Charlottesville, but had changed his mind at the last minute. According to Eric's communications with Esther, there were two versions of what he claimed happened the night Sage went missing. In the first, he had been waiting for Sage in the first version at the Amtrak station, but she never showed up. Sage had stood him up like he had accused her of in the text he sent. The second version of the story admitted the first was a lie. In an email sent December 3, 2012, Eric revealed that he had seen Sage, but before she reached him, she was approached by a group of people and he panicked. He wrote that Sage had enemies, failing to elaborate further. So he left the scene before seeing what happened next. He signed off, saying that he was sorry. This was the last official contact anyone had with Eric McFadden, and I don't believe that he is sorry. Either he lied in both versions of his story, and he knew what happened to Sage, or he was telling the truth and instead of coming back to help investigators identify the group of people who had confronted her, he ran away. Eric was officially named as a person of interest in 2016. Bizarrely, he wasn't reported as missing until June of 2019, almost seven years after he had last made contact with anyone from his old life. His mother claimed that she hadn't even known he was missing until 2014, and for the next five years, she believed Eric's father had already filed a missing persons report. Eric McFadden is still considered a missing person, alive, but on the run. His status has been downgraded from suspect to a potential witness. Police do not believe that Eric was directly responsible for Sage's disappearance and possible murder, because he did not own a car and the area where the two were scheduled to meet was busy and highly populated. Someone would have seen something. However, they do believe that Eric knows something crucial that could help them discover what happened to Sage Smith that night. Sadly, Sage's status is no longer being given the benefit of the doubt. In 2016, Sage Smith's disappearance was reclassified as a homicide. The cases of Faye Tinsley and Sage Smith are heartbreaking examples of unsolved mysteries leaving families and communities longing for closure. Despite the time that's passed, their loved ones are continuing to seek answers and justice. Faye Tinsley's family remembers her as a generous soul, always ready to help others. Her daughter Tootie remains dedicated to finding the truth about her mother's death, 
running a Justice for Faye Tinsley Facebook page and hoping for someone to come forward with information. Sage Smith's family has shown remarkable resilience in the face of uncertainty. Sage's grandmother Lolita and the entire family continue to fight for answers, highlighting the lack of attention on Sage's case and expressing frustration with law enforcement's handling of the investigation. Both cases remain active investigations, with rewards offered for information leading to arrests. The families urge anyone with information to come forward, hoping for closure after years of anguish and uncertainty. As we close this episode, we're reminded of the countless other unsolved cases nationwide. Each one represents a life cut short and a family left searching for answers. Let's hope that we can find some resolution and maybe even some comfort for the families left behind in these cases. If you like our podcast, please review us on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. It's a really big help. Follow us on social media. We're active on Twitter for now at truecrime underscore cases, Facebook at facebook.com slash truecrimecases W Laney, and Instagram at truecrimecases with Laney. Our website is truecrimecasespodcast.com, and you can follow me on Instagram at Lainey Hobbs BO or on TikTok at Lainey Hobbs. And we'd love to hear your episode suggestions. Send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was researched, written, and edited by Jesse Hawk of the Inky Paw Print, with content editing by Lainey Hobbs. Audio engineering produced by the best in the business, Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or at the Inky Paw Print.com. <laughs>